Okay. Hi, I'm Jenny go. McFarland with the, the Tucson Audubon Society, I'm the bird conservation biologist on staff, and we are going to be talking about purple martins today, but especially desert purple martins. These really are amazing birds that uh, if you live or visit southern Arizona, southeast Arizona especially in the Sonoran Desert area, you may have encountered purple martins in the desert, which is what our, our talk is called today. Purple martins in the desert? Question mark. And the answer is yes, there are absolutely purple martins hanging out in the Sonoran Desert. Now before we uh, share the screen, uh, I am presenting today from Tucson Audubon Society's uh, main location down on University Boulevard, uh, which is my office here, which is adjacent to our nature shop. But I also wanted to just show some of the books I pulled off my shelf back here in the conservation office uh, that have been very helpful to me in learning about Purple Martins as I move forward with this project. So I have things like the Sibley Guide to Bird Life and Behavior, which is really very good when you're looking at a general family. And then I have a, a love of big fat books and as well as sort of old tiny books. So this is an excellent book if you're looking for historical context on any bird in any bird species in sort of southern Arizona or pretty much all of Arizona and Sonora. So the Birds of Arizona by Alan Phillips, Joe Marshall and the great great Gail Monson, excellent book that had really, really interesting information about purple martins status in Arizona from uh, a perspective of you know 50 to 70 years ago, really interesting. And then the excellent Arizona Breeding Bird Atlas. This is a nice fat book, it's a big old book, but it's got really good information about uh, birds of Arizona and their breeding status, as well as really good summaries about species uh, of all the breeding species of Arizona and have really, really interesting profile on purple martins and how they occur in Arizona. Other books we're going to talk about specifically is the National Geographic uh, Birds of North America Field Guide. All right, so without any further ado, let's go to our presentation. Okay, share screen. Okay. Share. All right. Is that showing up, Luke? Can you see it? Okay. Yep, you're good. All right. Okay. So here we go. Two Snot about Society. This is our little header page with our, our mission statement on the side. But on to our talk. Purple Martins in the desert? Yes, is the answer. So this, this intro slide is showing some of our lovely desert purple martins sitting on a saguaro on the left, as well as some of the eastern martins on the right. And these differences of nesting strategy is going to be one of the, the key differences between these subspecies of purple martin. So purple martins, the relationship between Tucson Audubon, my time at Tucson Audubon, and purple martins has been really a very interesting one. It's been very much a journey of discovery when it comes to knowing about martins, finding out about martins, and learning more about them. So I don't know if anyone else here in the audience grew up in the Sonoran Desert, but I did. I grew up in Southern Arizona, never really lived anywhere outside of the, the Southwest. And I was absolutely blown away by purple martins. And my only exposure to martins has been this Southwest desert subspecies of purple martins. I imagine it's gonna be quite different for a lot of folks in the audience, but because um, I know most people grew up with sort of the eastern subspecies of purple martin, which is really very, very different, um, both in appearance, physical, there's physical differences between the birds, but they're also, their behavior is extremely different. Okay, so our journey, my journey with purple martins in Arizona uh, began here. This is the lower San Pedro River. This is a view um, taken by a Tucson Avon staff member during one of our surveys of the lower San Pedro River which because the San Pedro River flows from south to north, the lower section of the river is actually north of Tucson. So this is the view from um, San, uh, San Manuel, Arizona area. So this is sort of east of Mammoth, if you've ever been by Mammoth, if you take the 77 north. And this is the San Pedro River in the summer. And it's really an amazing location. And it's a beautiful green river. You can see towards the center here, this row of cottonwood trees flanked by Mesquite Bosque, which is then edged by upland Sonoran habitat and saguaros. 
And this is what it looks like when you're actually down in the river channel, the San Pedro, lower San Pedro River channel. It's lovely. Uh, there's sections of the river that flow year round. It's got a really nice cottonwood willow gallery. And during the monsoon season, it can flow a lot. It can flood, actually. It has some violent flood events that come through the river. And we spent many years doing bird surveys on the lower San Pedro. We started in 2016 and we did some sort of broad kits, broad scale surveys. Then we formed um, a relationship with a private landowner in the area and did surveys on the private land for many years. And that continued until 2014. And during that process of doing many, many bird surveys on the lower San Pedro River, we did get the area approved as an important bird area. This is one of my main jobs here at Tucson Audubon Society is coordinating, uh, co-coordinating the Arizona Important Bird Areas Program with Tysa Flea up in Phoenix with uh, Audubon, Arizona. And together we coordinated that program and the IBA was approved in 2007. And it was later upgraded to a global important bird area. So a site of bird habitat of global significance. And that was for the Bells Vireo. Uh, population. And we did so much work in the Lower San Pedro. It was, it was really a very fun, special time. Here's Matt Griffiths holding a dead turtle we found on his clipboard. Uh, but it's really a, a really interesting habitat. And we did my, migration surveys, upland surveys up in the Sonoran Desert, raptor nesting surveys, yellow-billed cuckoo surveys, as well as nocturnal surveys. And that's going to be relevant, very relevant in a moment. So here's a gray hawk nest we found. We spent one summer chasing gray hawk nests all over the lower San Pedro River. That was, that was really fun. But we were noticing desert purple martins hanging out in, especially when we did our upland desert surveys along the lower San Pedro River. And in 2012, we started doing driving census surveys in, at night. And these were focused on elf owl elf owl populations along the river using the mesquite bosque habitat adjacent to the San Pedro River. So we'd go out into the evenings to get sort of ready and get established and then start our owl surveys once it got dark. But we had been noticing for the last year, you know, 2011 into 2012, we'd been noticing purple martins hanging out along the road, especially in the evening. This is the photo that I took down uh, back in the day along the lower San Pedro River. And these are all purple martins hanging out on this wire and flying around in the air, you know, near these saguaros. Now how this area works on the lower San Pedro River near San Manuel, Arizona, is there's a road called River Road. It's a very creatively named road called River Road that runs parallel to the river. And where they put the road is it's right on the ecotone. It's right on the boundary from where you have the outer edge of the Mesquite Bosque and the starting edge of the sort of Sonoran Desert scrub habitat. So that's where the road is. And so that's the road we would drive in to start our owl surveys. So we would notice these martins during the summer, these martins just lining up, just absolutely cramming themselves onto these um, telephone wires. So that was pretty interesting. That definitely got our attention. And here's sort of a zoom in photo. And you can see from this photo that there's both males and females here. The really dark birds are the adult males. And the more lighter chested birds are going to be either juveniles or female birds, adult female birds. And why is the lower San Pedro so great for purple martins? I mean, I, I have still never seen densities like this anywhere in southern Arizona. They really cram in <laughs> to the San Manuel area. They love it. But why? Why is this area so great for them? And a lot of it has to do with what you're seeing here in this photo. So this is I'm sure it used to be a much more common site in Southern Arizona, but it's pretty rare now to have intact, lush riparian habitat, where you have an intact gallery and all of the, the, the beautiful biodiversity and insect life that comes with that, adjacent to, naturally adjacent to Sonoran um, upland, where you have these big old saguaros that are full of woodpecker holes and nesting cavities. So that is what makes the lower San Pedro so great for purple martins. Is these two habitats you wouldn't think of as being side by side, being very, very close to each other. Sonoran desert habitat and then uh, lovely riparian habitat. And there was another thing that was really bringing all those martins to that specific part of the road on the power lines right there, which is this pond. This is a pond on the private property in San Manuel that is, we had special access to because we were you know, doing surveys there with permission. And this pond is a really large pond and it's artesian fed. And 
they loved it. All summer, we, we would hang out by this pond and watch the martins come and drink and sort of do that thing martins do where they fly real close to the water and then boof right into the water to get a little bit of, of bathing action going on. So they loved this pond. And this was another really big draw for the martins to be hanging out in this specific area. So we spent a couple you know summers and the evenings counting martins, chasing martins around. And it really was my first introduction to these birds and really got me very, very interested in them. Here's another photo of them hanging out on the wires. And this was across the road from the pond. This is one of the biggest draws for them was this, this enormous, really nice pond. It's a big draw for people too. It's a really, really nice pond, big enough to sort of paddle around in. So purple martin, so that's, that was sort of our introduction, you know, my introduction at Tucson Anabon, uh, to desert purple martins, really the only martins I've been exposed to. But let's talk about martins in general. So purple martins are very charismatic birds and have been noticed a lot by many, many people. People like martins. They're very charming birds. And here's a quote from John James Audubon himself. Uh, in the 1840s, he said, <laughs> famously said, uh, almost every country tavern has a martin box and on the upper part of its signboard. And I have observed that the handsomer the box, the better does the inn generally prove to be. So people like martins. And this is uh, the plate from Audubon's famous, you know, Birds of North America uh, art collection. And the plate he did of purple martins shows a gourd with a hole in it. And this goes back to the, um, you know, early ornithologists like Wilson, would write about and you know documented that they would see indigenous people hanging gourds that had had a hole drilled in it like this and hollowed out in their uh, communities to attract martins that martins would nest in and that tradition really carried on into uh, you know later people in North America that would then put up boxes and they were so popular that even businesses were putting up martin boxes. So people really like martins, and I know why. They're, you know, they're extremely charming. But the more I looked into purple martins, knowing so little about the eastern ones, I didn't come into this with really sort of any of the sort of, you know, lore and assumptions that people who grew up in the east have around martins, where they have, you know, martins in their yards. So I went back and started thinking about martins in general. So, so martins as a genera. So the progne genera of, of swallows, which are the martins. And there's really only one in this regular in North America, and that's purple martins. So our purple martins are different, very different genera from uh, all the rest of the swallows. So that's the only prognate mart, you know, bird that we have here in North America. So I started thinking, well, what are the other prognate birds? And I was amazed when I looked at them at how close they look to purple martins. So this is, um, all the next slides are going to be from Birds of the World from Cornell, which I highly suggest. It's really neat to sort of get a sense of birds on a global scale, not just a United States scale. So here is a Cuban martin, which looks very, very similar <laughs> to a purple martin. And uh, each of these is going to have a range map in the bottom right corner. So this is where they occur, which is perhaps unsurprisingly in Cuba. And then here's Caribbean martin, which looks like a purple martin that with a little white tummy that occurs in the Caribbean. And then here we have Sinaloa Martin, which has also has a white belly and undertail on the adult male. And look at this range map. They're coming up sort of Western Mexico, coming so close to Southeast Arizona. I had no idea until I looked into this that there was a, a similar bird to a purple Martin, a Sinaloa Martin, that was just so close to Southeast Arizona, but just over the border in Mexico. And then gray-breasted Martin, which is a really interesting bird, that doesn't actually look that much like a martin. They do in size and shape, like so often with birds, the size and shape is really going to be the key there. The adult males, though, aren't really very purpley, but they do look a lot like a, a female purple martin, and their range is extensive. They're all over uh, sort of northern South America, west coast of Mexico, getting relatively close to Arizona. And then we have here southern martin, which is a really interesting South American only species of martin that looks a lot like a purple martin. And then Peruvian martin, which unsurprisingly is in Peru, <laughs> and has um, a very high conservation status of vulnerable. It's interesting. I thought that was actually pretty cool. 
And then Galapagos Martin, how exciting is this? It looks like a small purple Martin that is only in the Galapagos Islands. And then interestingly, brown chested Martin, which again is a similar size and shape to our purple Martin, doesn't really look that much like a, an adult male purple Martin in terms of coloration, but really does in terms of size and shape and looks a lot like sort of a giant bank swallow. And this is a, a bird of South America as well. But there is actually an Arizona record for this bird. So there's eight North American records. And by North America, they're excluding Mexico, because uh, that's the way bird maps work. But so eight North American records and one in Arizona, which was recorded near Nogales, February of 2006. So that was pretty interesting. So anyone who's uh, a birder who's always on sort of rare bird alert in southeast Arizona looking to find the next rarity definitely should be on the lookout for some of these martins where the ranges come pretty close to Arizona. It's pretty cool. So I thought that was really interesting to sort of get a perspective on martins from a global point of view. But let's talk about our purple martin, okay, our martin, the martin of the United States, the purple martin. So this is Prognisubis. And they're very cool birds, beloved by many people uh, through time. And here is the range map showing uh, where they occur. Let's look at that a little bit bigger. And I was also really interested on this idea because not having grown up in the Eastern half of the United States, this whole notion, there's a lot of mythology that surrounds purple martins. And some of it I was reading about that a lot of people believe, like for instance, that purple martins eat a lot of mosquitoes is false. They don't eat very many mosquitoes. Mosquitoes are a little bit too small for them to be sort of capturing and eating. They do eat a lot of bugs though, for sure. They eat a lot of insects like dragonflies and damselflies. And interestingly, I was reading on one website that this mosquito idea that they eat a lot of mosquitoes comes from this need to have animals be beneficial you know, to humans to sort of sell the concept that they should be sharing space with us. And so it did talk about how they do eat a lot of flying ants. So when ants start, you know, we, you see this in, right now it's happening now that monsoon is here, we get sort of the, the new queens, the baby queens and the males that start flying out of um, ant colonies to go found new colonies. Then when you get that in the um, Eastern half of the United States with the, the fire ants starting, the, the new queens going out to start out new colonies, that the Martins absolutely love those and gobble up a lot of those um, young fire ant queens and prevent new colonies from being established with a very unpopular fire ants. So I thought that was pretty interesting. But one of the myths, I don't even know if it's a myth, one of the, the facts you see a lot is that the Eastern Purple Martins are completely dependent on human provided nesting structures. And I thought that was very interesting because you hear that a lot about Martins and a lot of people say that as if it's true for all purple martins in North America. But I was even not even sure if it was true for Eastern purple martins. Are they really entirely dependent on human provided structures? So I thought that was very interesting. And if anyone has any insight that, on that, I'd love to hear about that on the end. Um, so I looked more into it. And what Cornell has is I think probably the best way to put it. So here's an example of what people do in the East where they have these martin boxes. And this talks about how there's two types. This is the hotel type, which is the one on the right, which includes separate compartments for each pair. Whereas other people will sometimes put up the gourd type, sort of, sort of that a traditional, you know, indigenous people's idea of putting up gourds for the purple martins with one pair per box or per gourd, but that they're lined up consecutively. Since this is important that purple martins are very much communal nesters. They're very, they like to form colonies among, uh, be near each other. And I think Cornell put it well. Without these nest boxes, Purple Martin distribution and abundance would be very different in the East. I think that is a very fair statement that if people were not providing these nesting opportunities for them, their distribution would be quite different. They would be have to, they'd have to be in areas where they could find naturally occurring cavities. So uh, this is from birdsoftheworld.org from Cornell. So here's that range map of Purple Martins again. And helpfully, this range map does show um, all of North America, including Mexico. And you can see here that they're quite common, quite widespread in the eastern half of the United States and then have very scattered locations here in the West. And then the yellow is um, migration. And here's a map showing the entire Western Hemisphere, <laughs> most of it anyway. And this gives us a better perspective that these birds will, uh, the orange being where they nest in the East, as well as areas of the, the West, 
very dispersed. They migrate through Mexico and Central America, and then they winter in South America. But to get a full picture of what's going on with subspecies, I had to go to the National Geographic Field Guide to Birds North America. Now this use of subspecies maps is to me one of the greatest strengths of this book. And I find myself going to it, and that's why I keep it on my shelf. Even though I tend to prefer the Sibley Guide for Bird ID, this Field Guide to Birds in North America from National Geographic has the absolute best maps, range distribution maps. And it's really very, very helpful for uh, trying to figure out what's going on with different subspecies. Since so often, some of the best ways to tell subspecies apart uh, if sometimes physical differences can be less obvious with many species and it has to do with where they occur. So this map is showing us that there are three subspecies that occur in, um, in the United States, in North America, and the eastern one is the Subis, so it's probably Subis Subis, and then there's this western subspecies, the Arbicola, which does occur in Arizona, here along sort of the Mokion Rim area, and then uh, as well as into New Mexico and the states north of Arizona, all the way up into the coastal Washington, Oregon, Northern California area. Uh, so it's been, been the one that Luke would have known uh, growing up. And then we have here in the extreme southeast corner of Arizona, as well as in Baja, California and Northwest Mexico, the Hesperia subspecies. Now this, if you've seen any of my other talks about migration or anything else, you'll recognize these maps. But this is from eBird. So this is a Cornell Lab of Ornithology map, and this is an animated map. Now what this is going to show us is sort of in time and abundance, the distribution of purple martins as a whole species, this is all the different subspecies, the whole purple martin species, where they occur in North America, when and in what density. So as this bar moves across from January through December, we'll see on the scale of abundance from yellow being sort of small abundance all the way up to blue, which is like really dense abundance, not only where the martins occur from eBird data, but when they occur. So this is very interesting to watch. Okay, so as we come into spring, they surge into the east, the Arbicola surges in, and then right here in Southeast Arizona, and become most abundant in July and August. So let's watch that one more time and really watch Southern Arizona. So once it hits June, they show up in Arizona, but once it hits July and August, they become very, very dense in Southeast Arizona. So you're seeing the, the Arbicola subspecies surge up first and then on to the desert purple martins. And here they are, the desert purple martins, AKA Hesperia. So that's their, their sort of Latin subspecies name. And I was really curious about Hesperia, like what does that mean in Latin or Greek or you know the non-English word that it is? So I looked it up and it had a very descriptive meaning. <laughs> Hesperia means literally in the Greek, it means west or western. So it's a western bird, <laughs> which is good. I thought, okay, at least it makes sense. So there's a really nice photo of a pair, uh, a breeding pair of desert purple martins hanging up, uh, hanging out on a, a saguaro. Now, anyone who grew up with martins in the east will notice that this female martin especially looks very, very different from the, the eastern female martins. Our martins are much, much paler in the female. The males look pretty darn similar. They're a little bit smaller, but they look pretty much the same plumage wise, but the females look very different. They are much, much lighter in coloration. And I also have a great love of going into old documents. <laughs> One of my favorite things of the internet is that you can go and find historical books that have been high resolution scanned and that are available for your perusal. It's really very, very interesting. And so I went, I was curious about when this Hesperia subspecies of the, you know, the desert nesting purple martin was first described. And this is the book where it first happened. This is the AUK, which is a ornithologi ornithological journal that is actually still around, the AUK. You can still um, see this journal, it still publishes. And this is an issue from 1889 of the AUK, back here, back is quarterly at this time. And in the table of contents here, it says, there's a, here on the right, 
There's descriptions of supposed new birds from Western North America and Mexico by William Brewster on page 85. Oh, let's go to page 85. Here we are. Page 85. 85, or excuse me, sorry. Yeah, it starts there. But then here we are. Here's the page where we actually have the, the new subspecies being documented and shared in a scientific journal. And here it talks about Progne subis hesperia, which is still the Latin subspecies name that the bird has, although he proposed to be called Western Martin, although we call it mostly, most people refer to it as the desert purple martin. And it talks about how the female differs. So he's talking all lots of chatter here, lots of scientific talk about this different specimens he's collected. And he talks about how the female specifically is much paler, how compared to the Eastern, it has tail coverts of pure white, nearly or quite immaculate. The throat, breast flanks, forehead, and fore part of the crown are grayish white. And that's a big difference. That's, that's still, that was a good observation from uh, this person who first documented this new subspecies of Western Purple Martin. So it happened back in 1889, and I thought that was pretty interesting. And it's actually sort of relatively late for, for these new species being reported, since a lot of new stuff was coming out of the Southwest before that. So he was a sort of lesser known subspecies even back in the day kind of late to be discovered. And then I did a, the, let's look at how study it is in modern times. Here is a, um, from Web of Science, a database that I just pulled this, this week. This is looking at how many scientific articles occur for, you know, if you can see it here, it's Progne Subis Subis, which is the Eastern Purple Martin. And I have 357 scientific articles that I could look at right now. And they ranged from so many different topics. So everything from sort of mercury exposure to nest parasites to breeding habits to all sorts of studies. The Eastern Purple Martins have been studied many different ways and very intensely. <laughs> and then when I pulled a, wanted to see how many articles were around of Western Purple Martins, so the, the, the Desert Purple Martin, the Progne Subis Hesperia, there was six. <laughs> so this is a very under studied group of birds. They have not been had a whole lot of um, scientific analysis that have happened with these guys, which makes them really very interesting from a Tuesday Audubon perspective. It gives us a chance to really look at these birds. And this paper right here, the number one article that came up is Coloniality and Breeding Biology of Purple Martins in Saguaro Cacti by uh, Bridget Stuchberry, which is a very good paper. It's from the early 90s. It was published in 1991, and she did her data, and I read it. It was a really good paper, 88 and 89, out in West Tucson. She trapped a bunch of nesting martins and wrote a whole paper about it, about how colonial they were. And it was very uh, good paper, but it's the only thing I could really find. And then the Arizona Breeding Bird Atlas is one of the few things that was cited, because very little has been published about these birds. So here's the sort of link to her paper. And this paper is freely available on Google Scholar. You can look it up anytime, and I think I'm gonna actually post it online so uh, anyone interested can find it easily. But it's a very good paper, and it was published in The Condor, which is another very well-regarded um, ornithological journal. And then I found this other thing. This is one of the only other things I found, <laughs> which was a, a really a, a note. Journals used to do this, where people could publish notes, which were small sort of uh, things. People had uh, not a whole paper, but a small, uh, note of interest they could get published so other people could find out about it because this is before the internet. So this was a really interesting one about Martin's nesting on an island off of Baja and so assumed to be the Hesperia subspecies sort of nesting in very small cacti on an island off of Baja. So that was a really interesting really interesting note but that's really that's from 1965 April but that was one of the the few things I could find in scientific literature about these desert purple martins. Now, rather than just show a bunch of photos of desert purple martins, let's, they're best seen in motion. And also their voices are amazing. You may have seen this video going around uh, on social media, not a bond, but sort of announcing our purple martin, our desert purple martin project. They're such dynamic birds. I wanted to show this minute and a half video. This is a nest we were watching in Greasewood Park. That was a young male. But he looks a bit like a you know, young male going up to his female in her in the nesting pack. Male hanging out on top of a fruiting sorrow and then flying away. That's a little pattern he's really related to the, the you're looking at a Martin. There she's picking her face out again. Aww. 
that is a breeding pair where the male is actually a female plumage, you know, which is interesting. Immature plumage. Males peeing out the swarm. And we have seen a female fly in there, so down in that cavity. Young, that same young male. I just love their voice, such amazing voices. And then a little, little teaser about how you can help with the study, which we will talk about at the end of this time, at the end of this presentation. But here is a bonus scene that did not make it into the video. I thought this was so good. Watch her, this is a female poking out of the nest. Watch her little throat. So she is singing back to the male. Quite a nice. That pale forehead, that's a really good mark for desert purple martins. The females having that pale forehead. Or, or immature plumage mate. You know? We saw this a lot the female hanging out in the cavity and the male sitting nearby, her arm kind of at the same level as the female staying near her. And speaking of films, there is actually a documentary that will be coming out um, pretty soon called Purple Haze. About, it's a conservation documentary about purple martins in North America. And uh, Zach Steinhauser, the um, creator of this film, did come out to Southeast Arizona and came to the, the Mason Center, Tucson Bonds Mason Center, to film purple martins and very generously shared a few clips with me. They're very short clips, but they're really good clips. There's a little female peeking out of a saguaro. Here's the last one. Let's see how pale that female is. Very lightly colored. So Martins, I think, are best seen in motion because they are such such poetic flyers, such really nice movers. But just not about Desert Purple Martin Project. Why are we even doing this? You know, why has this become such an emphasis? They are an Arizona important bird areas species of conservation focus. A lot of that has to do with the fact that they are so range restricted to Sonoran Desert, uh, where in the United States, you know, in the Sonoran Desert that we're familiar with, they nest in saguaros. In uh, the extension of the desert into Mexico, that where you don't have saguaros, but you have cardones, which are very similar looking plants, large kind of almost like a hybrid between a saguaro and an organ pipe cactus, but big, big uh, cacti, columnar cacti. They nest in those as well, but they're pretty restricted to those areas for breeding. They really are very much cactus nesters. And why Martins now? Well, this is from, this infographic here is from, you know, the, the three billion birds um, study that came out last year in 2019 and hit uh, major sort of mainstream media, a big study from uh, Cornell as well as many partners. And the aerial insectivores have had major declines in the last 50 years. And it's paralleled, you know, the cascading losses in insect populations. This really seems to be a key. So their estimation from this really significant study that came out from Cornell in 2019 is that Aerial insectivores in North America have suffered a 32% population loss in the last 50 years. And so they use barn swallow as their example, that two in five barn swallows are now gone from the landscape. So aerial insectivores, as insects take a big hit in our ecosystem, the birds that depend on them as a food source are also declining. So that's another big push, another big reason we're emphasizing purple martins now, since they're sort of our specialty aerial insectivore of Southeast Arizona. So we're going to be doing a lot of different components of the Purple Mart Desert Purple Martin project, and one of them is MODIS. So MODIS is a really interesting scientific movement that's been pushing through different parts of the world, but especially the eastern United States. So what these are is these are satellite trackers as well as antenna trackers. So you can get these tags that are very, very small. You see here they're you know not much, they're about the same size as a nickel. Uh, that you can put on um, a bird or a bat, or they almost have them small enough now to go onto butterflies. These little um, transmitters are so small, and they depend on these antennas called modus towers that you can establish um, out like this one, this photo from out in a field, but most people tend to put them on top of buildings. And they are antennas that 
will communicate with those trackers if they come within a specific distance of the antenna. And then any tracker that comes near your MODIS tower gets documented with the date, time, and location that that animal was there. So it's a way to put a really small tag on a small animal and had still get good information. However, to do this effectively, you have to have lots of MODIS towers that the track that the tags can communicate with. So this is a map for MODIS, a wildlife tracking system, and the yellow dots are established locations. So you can see here that this bird here, this thrush, is now gray cheek thrush, that he was they were pinging on these different towers as they all migrated to this this area in South America. And you can see here how many yellow dots there are on the east in the Great Lakes area, parts of Canada, Hudson Bay, but zero in Arizona. Well, Tucson Audubon um, is going to be putting up a MODIS tower at the Mason Center, as well as uh, almost certainly one at the Patton Center. So we are now getting in, throwing our hat in the ring for MODIS to help any researcher out there who puts a tag on to get data points if they come near our towers. So that's a very exciting thing we're going to be doing that is very relevant to Purple Martin studies. We're also going to be peeking inside of saguaros. So here's a, a female martin peeking out of her nesting hole in a saguaro. And here is myself with a really long pole trying to get a wireless endoscope into the hole to try to see what's going on inside that nest. Now, and on Eastern Purple Martins, it's very common practice to have your martin nest boxes uh, sort of all gathered together and on a winch that goes up a pole. And then people will lower them and do nest checks. Literally open the nest box and see what's going on inside. That is obviously not possible with our wild desert purple martins that don't use human structures but nest in woodpecker holes and saguaro cacti. So we're doing something totally different. <laughs> we're trying to take a pole with a little endoscope camera that's wireless and trying to look inside of a saguaro cavity. It's not that easy. That's a very long pole that sort of is uh, telescoping out. Luckily, it's not very heavy. It's a good pole, so I was able to kind of maneuver it. <coughs> and this is what the Martins must see when they look down and see me. This is a real photo taken by that endoscope as I was trying to peek inside a saguaro cavity. And let's see what the endoscope saw as I tried to look inside a saguaro cavity. Come on, fly. You see the ribs, the inner ribs of the saguaro. So that worked pretty well. So we're still working on this, getting our endoscope technique down, but uh, it is not that easy for sure. And uh, we're being very cautious now that we suspect the birds are on eggs right now. So that was me trying before the birds were even quite nesting yet. Um, another way that, there's a lot of ways that all of you can get involved with helping with this, this fledgling project of Tucson Audubon Society. And one of the easiest, actually most helpful things you can do is to just report your purple martins on ebert.org. So if you see purple martins, if you do encounter them, you can go to ebert.org, you can do a checklist. It's very helpful if you tell it that you want to show subspecies. You don't have to do this, but it's very helpful. And then if you, if they are desert purple martins, you can put them as purple martin hesperia. And then if you see them doing breeding behavior like nesting in saguaros, you can use this breeding pull down box to say that it's an occupied nest or whatever you observe, carrying nesting material, feeding young, any of these codes, you can choose those. Or if you just do purple martin and you do a description, if you just type out what you saw, that's very helpful to us. We have been actively looking at or excuse me, eBird purple martin sightings to try to find active nests that we can uh, watch and observe and get information about. So let's go to the website. So I am going to stop uh, doing. I am going to stop this presentation real quick and instead switch to the live internet. So this is the Arizona Important Bird Areas Program website. It's aziba.org. If you go to this website, right on the home page, I have the fact that we're doing. Uh, the Purple Martin study. You can go to the link and it takes you to this page where there's a lot of information about this project. So the, the Desert Purple Martin project, there's a little minute long video of me sort of trying to promo the project. And if you go down, it talks about Martins and the different ways you can help. So the main ways you can help is that what I just showed you guys, that if you, if you have Martins, 
you see Desert Purple Martins, put them on eBird. If you are not an eBird user, uh, if you don't use eBird, or you're not comfortable using eBird, I do have a link here to a form, it's like a Google survey almost, that you can fill out your sightings there. And we are checking those. So if you're not an eBird user, but you still want to share a sighting, that's a good way to do it. I also have uh, on the next one, number two here, is report a nesting colony of Desert Purple Martins. So if, if you feel like you have an area where there's saguaros, where the martins are nesting inside of those saguaros, you can share information with us about that location, especially if that location is open to the public, uh, or at least visible from an area that has public access. So that's pretty great. And then we are also having people join the project. So we're calling these the Desert Puma Crew, since Puma, P-U-M-A, is the four-letter banding code for Purple Martin. So Puma, uh, the, the Desert Puma Crew are people who are watching a colony actively. So visiting a colony at least once a week and making detailed observations, almost nature journaling about these birds, keeping track of just behaviors you see, uh, when certain milestones happen in the breeding cycle. So when you see them carrying food, when you see them uh, with fledged young, um, all that information. <clears throat> if you join that crew, you can have a colony either assigned to you or adopt your own colony. We have many participants that are doing this on their own property where they have Martin's nesting if they own a piece of property with high quality Sonoran Desert. And so if you want to join that crew, there's a link right here to do that. And then there's also a need we have that anybody can help with, which is we are really looking for samples of feathers from Desert Purple Martins. Um, NAU University in Northern Arizona is doing a lab study on, they're doing multiple things, doing a toxicology study, looking for, you know, uh, mercury loads or other pesticides perhaps in the, that there are signs of in the feathers if the birds were around those pesticides. We're doing a study of that as well as um, like an isotope study to try to figure out where the birds winter as well as a genetic study. So it's very interesting science that is gonna be done with these feathers. And I was so pleased uh, recently to find out that there is a whole frozen desert purple martin that uh, will be uh, donated to this study. So if you find feathers near uh, a nest site or if you find, you know, heaven forbid, if you find a dead purple martin out in the desert, please let us know. Let's get that thing frozen, get it on ice, and at the end of the summer we're going to take all the feathers and uh, whole martins that we have uh, up to NAU at the end of summer. So that's a really interesting part of the of the study that's going to be happening that anybody can help with if you find one. And then uh, here's some more information. If you join the Puma crew, Desert Puma crew, here's a, a video of me talking about protocols. And I have all this great information too about Purple Martins, how they're different, what's different about their nesting of the Desert Purple Martins, as well as just some clips of Martins that you just saw <laughs> on the presentation. So if you want to join, if you want to find out more about the, this project and you want to help with the project, all that information is on azibba.org. So the last thing I want to talk about is migration roosts. So the nesting study is going to be our summer study, but as summer winds down, or if I'm already thinking ahead, as summer winds down, purple martins start gathering in these large groups for sort of pre-migration hangouts. So this is a beloved phenomenon in the eastern United States. I have since learned researching this. Uh, the largest colony in South Carolina, the largest colony of Martins in Northern uh, North America is in South Carolina and you get these, you know, huge gatherings of Martins when they're getting ready to migrate and the local people love it. It's a whole thing. People go out and they, they watch the Martins that they all fly around in the evening and then they come together and will roost communally in a very small area. Many Martins in a very small area. Uh, it's a beloved phenomenon of the East. It's a less beloved phenomena on the wintering grounds in places like Brazil. And part of that, I was reading about this, was so interesting. Part of it has to do with the fact that Martins really seem to like urban areas. Uh, I wonder how much of it is them liking urban areas or being sort of driven out of natural areas due to habitat loss in South America. But they do gather in these urban areas. So here's a photo of just thousands of Martins hanging out on some telephone wires in a park in Brazil. And unlike the phenomenon in North America, where it's just a couple weeks, these Martins in Brazil hang out for six months doing this, gathering every night in these really tight communal uh, roosting areas, and they make a mess in a way that only birds can. 
And so they're less popular. This, this activity is less popular in South America. I thought that was a very interesting sort of angle on the, the, the Martin biology. But it's also something that we're going to be looking for in Southern Arizona. They do do these communal migration roosts in Southern Arizona. It is less dramatic than what you see in the Eastern half of the United States where they're just more populous, but they still do do it. So here's another old timey document. This is from the Condor again, and this is from uh, 1943, where someone submitted a note from Tucson, Arizona about the Martin roos in Tucson, Arizona. It was really interesting, it was 1943. And I have a zoom in here on the, the relevant part. So roosting behavior of purple martins during the summer and fall of 1943. Uh, and so it's just really interesting, careful observations from just a birder who submitted these, these uh, observations to the condor. It's such a charming thing to read, especially if you are familiar with Tucson. Our home on Kleindale Road, northeast of Tucson, has been directly in the path of a general evening flight of martins. Uh, now they gathered near uh, Binghampton Pond, one and a half miles east of us, six miles east of the Santa Cruz River roost of 1943. So presumably they roost in the vicinity of this pond. So it goes on and on about landmarks of Tucson where they've seen martins roosting. So this fall we're going to be asking any birder who's out in the Tucson area if you see martins, uh, especially if you see them gathering in large numbers. I have seen this happen in urban Tucson. I've seen mar you know, groups of martins in the 50 to 100 sort of scale gathering together and then roosting in trees in neighborhoods in Southern Arizona. So we're gonna be trying to document those, get those into eBird or into our own form to really document what's going on with migration patterns of Martins as well. So there's a lot going on with this summer for the, the founding of the Desert Purple Martin Project and we're gonna be doing it even more intensely next summer into fall. But we're really trying to get as much established and, and sort of as much data collected this summer as we can. Um, it's a great sort of project to be launching this time of this year, specifically of 2020, since it's an activity that people can do not as a group survey, but can do solo or with a, you know, a partner they cohabitate with. So uh, I'm really excited to be launching the, the Desert Purple Martin project and to be learning so much about Martins. And I hope you guys uh, enjoyed this as well. Do we have any, any questions? Oh, I see a raised hey. hand. I'm going to stop sharing the screen. We got a raise hand. Oh, right. Bill's got his raise. Hey, Bill, you should be unmuted now. Or it looks like you might you have to unmute yourself. Okay, I just unmuted. There you go. Okay, hi, guys. Uh, I, I look back at my old photographs of Purple Bartons. It's, you know, I'm a 20 year person here in Tucson, more or less, but right. I didn't see my first ones until June of 2015 in Sabino Canyon. And there's a particular saguaro, you guys, some of you may know about it, uh, where I've looked every, I've watched them every year because two of them, a pair of them come back and nest in the same pole and the same saguaro they have for the last six years. Uh, and I don't know that they're the same pair. Uh, they have young there and so on, but uh, uh, that's just been my observation, and so I was just sort of wondering if you have any insight into whether it could be the same pair that come back year after year to the same nesting site. That's a really interesting observation, and if you, um, if you have any sort of documentation of that, photos maybe from year to year, that'd be really interesting to, to, to get that information so we can sort of document that. But Bridget Stuchberry's paper, the only paper <laughs> about nesting Desert Purple Martins did, she did a two year study where she watched, you know, the same saguaro patch. Um, she had multiple nests in the scale of, you know, 30 to 40 nests that she watched in west, west of Tucson. And she did see a distinct trend over those two years of the majority of nesting holes her first year were used again the next year. Um, so it does seem like, and other people have sort of anecdotally reported what looks like nest fidelity, them coming back to use the same nest over and over again. Now without banding, it'd be sort of impossible to say for sure that it's the exact same birds, but I'd suspect that it probably is. And even if it's at least, you know, within a, several years, it's probably the same pair, but as, you know, they don't live forever, so it's a good spot. So maybe then in the future, different martins take over that location, but I think it probably is the same birds. But again, such an understudied bird that is, it's hard to say for sure, but I think, I think they probably are. I'll keep watching them. Yeah, yeah, please. 
if they open up Sabino Canyon again. Yeah, yeah. That's November first. Yeah. November one. That's the new day. November one. Yeah. Okay. Hey, I have a question actually for you, Jenny. How many people do you have already on your Desert Puma crew? I have um, somewhere in the the ten to fifteen range. Okay. And we'll be doing a lot of um, communication with everybody today on that. But yeah, it's we have we have a fair number. We certainly could use more. 10 to 15, we could double that for sure after this, right? Uh, I hope so. But even because even if you don't, if you're not here all summer or you can't commit to that sort of time commitment, even just reporting your Martins on eBird, which I, I really like the eBird method since it shares the sightings with any researcher who's looking at this. But um, so even just sharing your sightings is super helpful. Cool. Would the best, so um, later on this afternoon, I'll be sending out an email. <clears throat> with a recap and a recording of the session. I'm going to include Jenny on that email. She'll be CC'd on there. It would the best way to uh, be a part of that, would it be better to um, email you, Jenny, or would it be better to go through the IBA uh, website and sign up that way? You know, I would check out the IBA website to see what you're getting into and then just send me an email. If you do want to do it, just email me. Fabulous. Yeah, sounds good. Any other questions before we head out? That, that was awesome, Jenny. Oh, thank you. I'm glad you liked that. All right. I'm going to unmute everyone. We'll have a, a few moments to just verbally thank Jenny. Oh, let's chatter. <laughs> very, very good, Jenny. Thank you. 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 Bye-bye. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Great. Good to see everyone. Thank you. Have all. a good weekend. Bye. 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 Can I say something? Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. Go for it. Yeah. Um, I've, I've been spending a lot of time on the um, proposed route for Interstate 11, west of the Tucson Mountains. Yes. And I've seen um, some nesting mountains uh, there. Uh, plus a lot of other martins that I ha don't know whether they were nesting or not. But anyway, um, I, it's uh, south of Sanawa Road, west of Sondaria Road. I just wanted to let everybody know it, um, that that's a, a, another good reason to oppose Interstate 11 west of the Tucson Mountains because mm -hmm. the the, uh, the nesting martins uh, in the Saguaro right. there. There's lots of lots of big saguaros that that can't be transplanted. Uh, just oh. uh, just south of Sanagua Road and north of Sanagua, yeah. too. So I yeah. just great. To thank you for mentioning and that. I'll, and I'll put I'll put those on on eBird that I yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank cool. You. Thanks, Frank. And I'm glad that uh, you're able to join in on the presentation. So that's yeah. good. Yeah. Took me a little while to get on it. But. <laughs> yeah. The first couple times is there's a learning curve, but then then it'll be smooth sailing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, right. Jenny. Yep. You're very welcome. Thank you. Great comments. All right. Have a good one, guys.